Okay, first test of the day. Check. How you all doing? You feeling energized? Uh, my uh, name is Jose Echeverry. Uh, I am the uh, candidate for the Green Party of Ontario uh, for Markham Stouffville. So how do you introduce a panel like the one we have without going into the dark places of uh, the destruction of the planet? I suppose it can be done by saying that we don't have any need whatsoever to destroy the planet. We have the technology, we have the money, what are we missing is the political commitment to do the right thing. Um, David's advice needs to be really, really heard because this is a guy that has the most incredible story. I mean, he hates when we introduce him like this, but David, I'm sorry, man. You're 82 years young and you're gonna regale us now. I know you're going to enlighten us with whatever it is you want to tell us. And I ask one favor and one favor only. Let's give him an awesome round of applause. <laughs> Wait, wait till I'm finished. No, thank you very much. I'm uh, delighted to be here tonight. Thank you, Jose. That was, uh, where is Jose? Oh, <laughs> a very generous uh, introduction. One of the things I've, I've felt with the David Suzuki Foundation, which I'm very, very proud to have uh, been a part of, is that we have quite a high turnover. We're too small to hold people indefinitely because they want to do more and they're ambitious and so they have opportunities like Jose's. But I feel part of what the Suzuki Foundation is doing is providing uh, people like that who have a background training and uh, perhaps learn a different way of seeing the world to go out and, and uh, I still feel that Jose is part of our, the, the family that is the Suzuki Foundation and, and very proud of that fact and that's why I wrote him and said, hey, I'm going to be in Toronto uh, just before Earth Day because I'm going down to Guelph. Uh, and uh, if you can make use of that time, please do, because I just, he's part of my family. Thank you very much for coming out. It's such a beautiful day today. Uh, I think it's been three weeks since I've seen the sun in Vancouver. Uh, so it's a delight to... Uh, uh, to see that and, and be here today. I, I am 82 and at my age, you know, you get all crusty and cynical and, you know, so I look at politics in a very, uh, very different way. And what I understand now is the problem with politicians is politics. Good people run for all of the parties, but they get caught up in, in politics and politics determines that once elected, the very first job, the first priority is to get re-elected. And uh, then, of course, the party imposes the limits on what you can or, or cannot do or say. So politics itself is a, a constraint. Just let, let me give you some background. I, my mother and father were born in Vancouver. Dad in 1909, my mother in 1911. My grandparents came from Japan uh, between 1904 and 19. Oh, six. So my mom and dad had been raised in, in Canada, never been to Japan, but of course in 1941 when Pearl Harbor happened, uh, Canada then in uh, 46 applied the War Measures Act and declared that we were no longer uh, subject to the rights of Canadian citizenship. But even up until then, my grandparents and my parents couldn't vote. If you were an Asian, Chinese, Japanese, whatever, you couldn't vote even if you're born and raised in the country. Uh, we were wiped out uh, by the war and we, uh, we moved to British Columbia, didn't want any more Japanese uh, in the province, so we either were told, get the hell out of here and go to Japan or go east of the Rockies. And so we ended up in Ontario. When uh, they got the right to vote, my parents in 48, I always regarded that as a tremendous responsibility and a privilege to be able to vote. I have voted in every federal election since I turned 
21. And until 20... No, you haven't waited for the kicker. Until 2015, I never voted for a party that won power. And that's why I voted in 2015 strategically. Elizabeth has never forgiven me for this. Fortunately, the person I voted for, who was a liberal, was a good candidate, Joyce Murray. She's great. But I, I voted, I've been a green voter for years now, but I voted in desperation because of the, the tyranny of the, the, the Harper years. Um, so when Trudeau was, was elected, of course the sun came out. And I have four daughters. When he said gender equity on, uh, in cabinet, I said, wow, that is fantastic. And he's done it. And that was a really important thing. But his big promise to me was, you will never vote first past the post, in a first past the post system again. And he said it not only before the election, but after it. He repeated it. And then, of course, uh, political sense came to him, and he realized, whoa, that's going to give up a lot of our, our opportunity to be a majority party. And so he then, he then wrote it off. And that, to me, was when I realized the trouble with politicians is politics. He uh, went to Paris, and boy, was that wonderful. After nine and a half years of Harper, he went to Paris, not only signed the agreement, but said, we aspire to trying to keep temperature below, or closer to 1.5 than 2. That's a very, very tough target. We celebrated. I emailed him, and I said, are you serious about Paris? He said, absolutely, I'm serious. So it was great. And then he approved of pipelines. Not only Kinder Morgan, but he approved line three, which is going to hook up with the Keystone. I think politically, he knew, we knew that the Northern Gateway was dead. The indigenous people had said, and it wasn't going through. But he knew he's going to take a shit kicking in Vancouver or over Kinder Morgan. Meanwhile, there's nothing being said about line three that's going to go down. Trump has passed Keystone, and it's going to hook up. That is the most cynical political ploy I can imagine. So that's when I emailed him. He replied to my emails until I emailed when he approved the pipelines and I said, why did you run for office? Didn't you run for office so you could be in a position to do something to protect your children's future? You have young children and you've just made a decision that is going to reverberate through the lives of your children. Surely your children come before politics. And that's when, that's when he stopped replying to my emails. I just want to give you some background. I, I, uh, uh, one of the eminent, well, the eminent climatologist in Canada is Andrew Weaver. Uh, he's the head of the Green Party in British Columbia. I was amazed when he gave up his academic position to run as a Green. And it was astonishing that he won. He's been a magnificent, I think, uh, member of, uh, of the legislature. But I said, look, you guys need more, uh, you, you need more weight, heft. And I will uh, help you campaign if you limit me to the to candidates who really have a serious shot at winning. And never imagined in my wildest dreams that they would not only elect three, but hold the balance of power. I mean, what? <laughs> so, of course, magnificent. But let me tell you, Site C, the dam at Site C on the Peace River, I have been fighting now. The first time I went up north to fight for Site C was 1981. Weaver said when he ran, he opposed Site C. Horgan said he opposed Site C. They, and, but Horgan didn't take power and then immediately cancel Site C. He set up a committee to look at it. He wanted an excuse. And in the end, the, the committee said it doesn't make economic sense. But he went ahead and, and uh, approved the site, the, the dam. Now, the reason I raise this is that Andrew Weaver, who I supported and got elected so that he would do the green, the right things, said, I'm not going to bring the government down. 
in order, in order to protect Site C. And uh, the reason is that his highest priority is to get proportional representation. Because without proportional representation in the next election, he's going to be reduced to nothing. I mean, he'll, he may get members elected, but it'll either be a liberal or an NDP majority. So it, politics again intruded. That area that is going to be flooded should be the breadbasket of the north. It's the major farming area. And our food chain, with climate change, we can't have a food chain where food is grown thousands of miles from where it's ultimately eaten. We have to eat much more closely. And as, as a climatologist, Weaver should know that. But politics intruded. We have had, uh, we've been working on climate change. Jose was working with us on climate change for years, way before the Kyoto Conference. And the head of our climate group was a man named Jerry Scott. And for years we were saying, you know, we've, we've got to have a carbon tax and we've got to reduce fossil fuels. Jerry then, just before the, the uh, election, oh, this is a couple of elections ago, left the foundation to go and be one of the uh, guides for the NDP. And so I was delighted, you know, one of our, the head of our climate change guy going now to be uh, a, a thinker for the NDP. And what did he come up with? Ax the tax. Gordon Campbell, uh, a liberal, who, but liberal means conservative in British Columbia, <laughs> the head of the Liberal Party totally unexpectedly brought in a carbon tax, which British Columbia is very proud of and brags about. And Jerry Scott knew very well that that's what we have to put a price on carbon. It's a very effective tool. And Ax the tax became politics. The problem with politicians is politics. It was an economic or a political opportunity, he thought, and I'm absolutely convinced that they lost that election. They were poised to take over. They lost the election because of that hypocrisy. There were enough people that cared about that tax and, uh, and supported uh, uh, the liberals. So, you know, I, <laughs> what the hell is there a Green Party for? The problem with the Green Party is it Everybody acts as if, well, the Greens are the ones worried about the environment. And with, you know, the Conservatives, they're the party of economics and the Liberals, I don't know what they are. But the, the point is, as Jose said, there shouldn't be a Green Party that's crazy. It's not the purview of a political party. It should be the foundation of all parties, should be to protect the air. But having said that, having said that, thank God the Greens are here, because they have been the voice. And, and a Andrew has been effective. I, I'm convinced that in order to keep the, the government we have in BC, Andrew made an agreement with the NDP that they wouldn't bring them down if certain conditions were met. And one of them was no to Kinder Morgan. I, Horgan would have caved a long time ago, but thanks to the Greens, he's stayed very, very strong. And that's been, uh, thank you, uh, Andrew and the Greens for that. And I think of, I think of Elizabeth May. Thank God for Elizabeth. I mean, she is single-handedly, but you know, she, she can't do it. We need sustainable activism. And, as a one member, there's too much pressure on her. We've got to get more people in there to, to relieve some of the burden. I am absolutely sure when Harper was par passing these omnibus bills, which is so undemocratic, load up these huge bills, right? Elizabeth was the one person in Parliament that read every bloody page. So, you know, an astounding uh, performance. I'm sorry, I had a whole speech written here, but I got kind of uh, pulled off. I, I'm here to support Jose, and I'm here to support you. Uh, we're, it's your event tomorrow I'm going to, right? Yes. And Elizabeth said, you've got a real shot. You bloody well better win this. Yes. But I want to explain why I'm still willing, even though I'm, I'm you know, cynical about the politicization of, of candidates, uh, 
why I'm still here to support Jose and Mike and, and uh, Andrew. And that is that we are at an absolutely critical moment in the 3.9 billion years that life has existed on this planet. There has never been a single species able to have the impact that human beings are now having on the planet. That's why scientists now say the period from about 1945 on is what is called a new geological epoch, a geological moment in time. The Anthropocene epoch is when humans have become the major force shaping and altering the physical, chemical, and biological properties of the planet on a geological scale. It's, uh, it's, it's the congruence, the very sudden congruence of a number of factors. Very, you know, one is, is our numbers. We're a sheer force of human numbers. We are the most numerous mammal on the planet. And every one of us has to be fed, clothed, and sheltered, and that gives us an enormous, what's called an ecological footprint. It takes a lot of air, water, and land just to keep every one of us alive. But of course, we're not uh, uh, just another ma a mammal like a rabbit or a mouse or a, or, or a rat. We have an enormous amount of technology, most of which has been developed within the last century, that we can use to exploit the, the planet, to explore every nook and cranny in search of, of something we can use. And uh, technology then amplifies our ecological footprint enormously. And ever since World War II, we've been afflicted with an incredible appetite for stuff. You know, we love to shop. And there was a survey in the United States where 98% of teenage girls consider shopping their number one recreation. So I guess you exercise at the same time you're choosing what to, to, to buy. And the terrible, I, my, my family hates it when I bring this up, but it really makes me sick. We used to, when, when after the war, my family was, we were destitute, we had nothing. Uh, but I was in a growth phase, I was just entering my teen years and, and uh, I needed a coat. When we moved to Ontario, my God, they have this stuff called snow. So my parents had to scrape together and bought me a new coat. But I was in a, a growth spurt and I outgrew that coat in a matter of months. It went to my twin sister, Marcia. And Marcia wore it for a couple of years and then she outgrew it and it went to our next sister, Eiko. So my parents used to boast this coat went through three kids. You know, because they were boasting what a great buy that was. It's durable, you know? And now, that's crazy, right? I mean, the, the, the thought that one coat would be used, I mean, you gotta be fashionable, right? I mean, I was told uh, just yesterday there's one big fashion uh, line that used to have their annual presentation of the new, their new line. And then it became seasonal, like there was a fall line and a winter line. And, and then now they have a new line every week, right? We used to, I wore blue jeans all the time up until a few years ago because blue jeans wear like iron. And now I see people who are walking down the street in blue jeans they paid hundreds of dollars for that are full of rips. <laughs> what the hell is that? To me, to me, every time I see it, I can't tell you, it's like a kick in the stomach. When, because what it is, is saying, I don't give a shit about the earth. I just want to look good. Well, I don't think it looks good. But this whole idea that fashion is driving uh, clothing now to, in such a wasteful way is, is a statement about what the crisis is. Our consumptive habits. You know, my mom and dad were married during the Great Depression. And that was what shaped their way they looked at the world and their values. And because of that, they pounded into my head, live within your means, share, don't be greedy, help your neighbors, you may one day need their help. I... Save some for tomorrow. And they used to say, you have to work hard for the necessities in life, but you don't run after money as if the stuff you buy makes you a bigger, more important person. But we are way past the necessities. 70% of the Canadian economy is there to serve our, our wants. It's about consumptive uh, consumption. 
And that was a deliberate thing that happened. World, uh, we went through a very terrible time during the Great Depression of the 30s. What pulled us out of the war, uh, out of the Depression, was World War II. Wars are great for getting economies going. You've got to pump out planes and guns. And, and the American economy then, because they weren't fighting in America, blazed white hot. But by 44, the Americans realized, we're going to win this war. But what, do we, how, what kind of an economy do we have in peacetime? And so the president set up the American Council of Economic Advisors and said, how do we transition from a wartime economy to a peacetime economy? And the answer was consumption. Get Americans to buy stuff, use them up, throw them away, and buy more stuff. Americans should worship at the altar of consumption. And it worked. And so we're in a position where consumption is driving our economy. You know, and if you, in the past, if you got tuberculosis, they said you had consumption, right? <laughs> consumption was destroying your body. But uh, uh, this is one of the, the big things that's happened, is this huge acceleration in our consumptive habits. And as I passed up, driving up here, looking at these, whoa, unbelievable, on good farmland, all of these homes that you guys are living in, and you know, 40 years ago when the population, the average size of a family was twice as big, the average size of a house was half as big. So today you have fewer people living in bigger homes. And why? Because we got so much stuff to put in it. You know, so we're, we have to look at the way we're living. This is so totally unsustainable, the way that we're living uh, all across uh, the, the country. And of course, we have a global economy now that is just driving us right into the ditch. So when you add those things together, our numbers, our technology, our consumption, and our global economy, we have become a force as has never been on the planet. Life has always modified the planet. Before uh, plants evolved on this planet, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. Oxygen is a very highly reactive element. When there's oxygen, immediately reacts or oxidizes things. So before there were plants, there was no oxygen. It was plants over millions and millions of years that transformed the atmosphere into the oxygen-rich one we have. It was life that helped to wear down mountains and boulders and create soil. Life has been a huge part of the uh, change in the planet's properties. But over millions of years, and countless species involved in the process. This moment is unique because we are at the heart of everything. We are at the heart. We have this enormous power, but we don't know enough to manage the impact of what we're doing. Just want to remind you, you know, we, I hear, keep hearing technology. Well, technology is going to solve it. Well, in the 1930s, a man named Paul Mueller working for uh, Searle, I think, in, in uh, Geneva, or in Switzerland, discovered that DDT kills insects. Wow, was that a great discovery? We gave him a Nobel Prize in 1948 for that discovery. But then years later, Americans began to notice their great iconic bird, the American eagle, was disappearing. They said, what the hell is going on? And they discovered a phenomenon that science didn't even know about called biomagnification. You spray in concentrations per million that's absorbed by microorganisms who are eaten by bigger organisms, and at each level up the food chain, you concentrate it. So by the time you get to the fatty tissue in, in the shell glands of birds, that affects the eggshells, or the breasts of women, you've concentrated DDT hundreds of thousands of times. And over and over again, we find we don't know enough to really know what the implications of our technologies will be. When bombs were, atomic bombs were dropped on Japan, we didn't know there was a thing called radioactive fallout. That was discovered in, over Bikini years later. We didn't know about electromagnetic pulses of gamma rays that knock out electric circuits. We didn't know about nuclear winter. When CFCs began to be used, we didn't have any idea that they would begin to weaken the ozone layer. Over and over again, we think technology is going to get us out of the hole that we created but we don't have the humility to say we don't know enough to do that. And um, I fear that our inability to take climate change seriously 
in order to keep our, uh, to begin to reduce our emissions seriously, is leading us to where the only choice we'll have in a few years will be geoengineering. We've got to take over the planet's atmosphere and try to engineer it so that we can live at a comfortable temperature. And believe me, we don't know enough to do that. But that is the technological. Now, we do need technology. There's no question about it. But I think that we have to be a lot more humble, acknowledge our ignorance, and rather than just think, I'm going to come up with the best solution, go to nature and say, how the hell do you do it? You know, every species has the same problems, right? We got to get food, we got to excrete our waste, we got to find a mate, we got to have kids, we got to feed them, uh, we've got to protect them. Well, every species has a problem. How do you do it? This is a phenomenon Janine Benyus has called biomimicry. Have more humility, ask nature how they've solved problems, and then we can try to copy that. And the, the thing I feel, every time I fly over BC's forests. I look out of the plane and all I see is every green thing saying, give it to me. Because that's the source of everything. Then you fly over Vancouver or Toronto and all you see is the flat roofs of warehouses, houses, streets, uh, sidewalks. You know, all those surfaces should be gathering solar energy. And uh, we've got to be clever enough to do that. Let's become like a We've got to become like a forest, you know, rather than have these heroic uh, uh, measures to solve it. So our problem is that uh, today, I think, is that we uh, live in a world where we can't see the magnitude of the problems we've created. For 95% of human existence, we were nomadic hunter-gatherers. We followed animals and plants through the seasons. And when you're carrying everything you own on your own back, you know that you, your very survival and, and livelihood depends on nature. Nature is the source of everything when you're a nomadic hunter-gatherer. 10,000 years ago, we began that huge revolution in the way we live with the agricultural revolution. But farmers understand very well, you know, pollination, nitrogen fixation by certain species, uh, winter snow is related to the amount of soil, uh, moisture in the soil in the summer, uh, farmers understand weather and climate are a critical part of who they are and how well they do. Farmers know we're deeply embedded in nature. I believe it's been the shift from farming to big city dwelling that has resulted in a real blindness on our part. When you, you know, I have a friend who lives in North York. He said, my apartment building is completely air conditioned. I go down the elevator in the morning into the basement, into my air-conditioned car, drive down the Don Valley Freeway into the basement of my commercial building, completely air-conditioned, and that building's connected through tunnels to all the shopping areas. He said, David, I don't have to go outside for weeks. So do you think then that you're connected or understand our dependence, our embeddedness in the natural world? We live in an urban setting where your highest priority becomes your job, right? We need a job to earn the money to buy the things we want. And so you see the ultimate expression of that in Stephen Harper, who said, we can't do anything about reducing emissions, it'll destroy the economy. So he elevated the economy above the very atmosphere that gives us weather, climate, the seasons, the air that we breathe. That's insanity, if you ask me. But that's the problem, and because we live in cities, we're no longer as aware of what's going on in the world, in the environment. I, um, I thought I'd just report a few things that uh, have really stunned me. Last year, as you know, the Cancer Agency announced half of all Canadians are going to develop cancer. If that isn't a shock and a wake-up, what the hell is going on? And this year, I've forgotten which agency it was, we were told that one out of every 66 Canadian youth between 5 and 16 years of age has uh, autism spectrum disorder. Well, what the hell do we expect? You know, I, uh, I spent 30 years of my life 
as a geneticist studying fruit flies. And one of our great discoveries, we discovered a mutation affecting nerves, nerve mutant. And it was spectacular. And uh, uh, I got a big government grant to study this mutant. And because the nerves in fruit flies are the same as the nerves in us. So you think about that now. We have the same nerves. We study fruit flies to learn about ourselves. Why is it that the pesticides we're now using are nerve toxins? And then we wonder, holy cow, we've got a, an outbreak of autism? What the hell do we expect? We are the earth. Whatever we do to the air, water, soil, we do directly to ourselves. So do we think that when we spray poisons onto plants and animals, that that's not going to affect us? We're biological creatures. We're subject to the same kinds of <coughs> responses as uh, any other biological, uh, any other biological uh, uh, organism. We, uh, you and I, there isn't a single person in this room who could go to a doctor and get tested and not find every one of us is carrying dozens of toxic chemicals in our bodies. Well, what do you expect? We're eating food that's covered with it. It's inside the food that we're eating. We're spraying it onto land, air, and water. We're, uh, that's where the connectedness with nature is necessary. We can't escape it unless we want to live in a bubble uh, all our lives. Three quarters of the insect species in Germany are reported to have been eliminated in, what, 20 years? I'm an, I used to be an avid insect collector when I was a boy. I loved beetles. And that, when I read that, I said, oh my God, that's horrific. That is amazing. When, after the war, we ended up living in Leamington, Ontario. And every spring, there was a hatch of mayflies out of the lake, so prolific, they covered entire houses with their bodies. And you, you couldn't see outside because it'd be covered, with, your windows would be covered. They would cover the highways and cars would skid on their carcasses and, and have accidents. They would pile up on the beaches, three, four feet thick. All of that biomass and the fish, I was a fisherman too, I'd just go out and catch fish one after another. They were in a feeding frenzy. And that biomass was gone in 10 years because Farmers began to use pesticides in a big way, and they washed into the waters of, of Lake Erie. We, uh, Canada's monarch butterfly, an iconic species, has been in catastrophic decline. And uh, I don't know if you saw the day before yesterday that the uh, woodland caribou, the Selkirk herd, has now been reduced to three females. It's extinct. It's gone. And yet we keep looking, what's the cause? Is it the wolves? Is it... Hey, fella, look in the goddamn mirror at what the cause is. We're not willing. So, well, I've, I've totally ruined my speech. How much time do I have now? I, I, I wanted, I just, I started to get interested in the history of the way that we treat uh, we treat crises uh, that evolve, and I thought, I want to look at the history of asbestos. Asbestos has been known uh, and used by people for over 4,000 years. But it was really in the 1800s that asbestos, which is this long fibrous material, very heat resistant, uh, water resistant, it's an amazing uh, mineral. And in the 1800s, people began to make cloth out of asbestos. And it was great, you know, if you made cloth, uh, asbestos napkins and got it dirty, you just throw it in the fire and then you could pull it out after and, and the, it, the napkin was clean because it was fire resistant. It was, and in 1870, uh, uh, asbestos has been mined around the world. Uh, Australia was the biggest producer. But in 1870, a big a deposit of asbestos was discovered in the Thedford Hills in Quebec. And very quickly, people began to say, this is Canada's white gold, this magic stuff. And boy, we began to pump it out and mine it and make products, use it for a lot of insulation against sound, against temperature. And uh, it was a big money generator for, uh, for, uh, uh, for Quebec. In 1899, you get the first report 
that there seems to be problems, health problems, with the miners, 1899. And then in... Uh, in eight, uh, sorry, 1924, you got the first actual naming of the pro problem that miners are having called asbestosis. People were getting lung cancer from asbestos. In 1930, the United Kingdom reported that 66% of miners who had mined asbestos for more than 20 years, 66% uh, developed asbestosis. So it was a potent, but, but you had to be exposed to it for a, a long period of time. Australia was a leading company, uh, a country that was mining, uh, mining asbestos, but by the 1970s, everybody knew it was a dangerous material. The EU then, uh, <clears throat> in, in 1983, even Australia stopped mining uh, asbestos. It phased it out in 1989 and finally banned it in Australia in 2003. Now Quebec, in Quebec, asbestos became a big part of the economy of Quebec. In the 1920s, Canadian insurance companies said, uh, we're not gonna, we're gonna, not gonna give you insurance for asbestos mining, miners, it's dangerous. So in 1966, a McGill professor was given a $500,000 grant from the Asbestos Mining Association. And guess what? He reported that no asbestos doesn't cause cancer. <laughs> Whoever pays a piper calls a tune. In, uh, in the 1990s, oh, in 1984, the Ontario Royal Commission recommended phasing out asbestos, 1984. In 1990s, <clears throat> Canada sued the French government for their banning of asbestos, trying to overturn the French ban. In 2006, Canada vetoed a move by the UN to ban asbestos. Uh, Canada, in 2007, began a study of the effects of asbestos. 2008, they said it's got to be peer-reviewed. 2009, the report said, Asbestos causes lung cancer. <laughs> and in 2011, the Canadian Cancer Society and 25 other health organizations begged the Canadian government to ban asbestos. In 2012, a year later, Quebec put $58 million into the asbestos mine it's called the Jeffrey Mine. And it's only in 2018 that Canada has finally banned all Product. So you see, the terrible thing is once you have an economic opportunity and it begins to be widely used, it becomes very difficult, despite all of the negative evidence, it becomes very difficult to phase it out. Carbon is now the new asbestos. Carbon is, we need carbon to live, but now what we're doing with, you all know, our uh, dependence so heavy, heavily on fossil fuels. We're overwhelming the planet's capacity to reabsorb the carbon that we generate through the burning of fossil fuels. And we're cutting down the best carbon remover there is, called trees, at a phenomenal rate. So this double whammy then, huge output of carbon through burning of fossil fuels and destruction of carbon removal systems has created the problem. I was going to go into the history of what we've done on climate change, but I don't have time to do that. I just want to remind you one thing in the past. In 1973, the OPEC countries, what is OPEC? Oil producing export countries. The OPEC countries began to turn off the spigot. And for those of you that are old enough to remember, that was a frightening time because the price of fuel skyrocketed and there were shortages. We had to line up at gas stations for the pump. And of course, Americans began to shoot each other. That's the way they solve problems. <laughs> <clears throat> but Canada said, holy cow, we, we don't have any kind of plan about energy in this country. And so they appointed one of our eminent scientists to head a commission, Ursula Franklin, said, <clears throat> How do we, uh, what do we do about this? And in 19, I thought it was you, Dorothy. I, I, in 19, 
78, Ursula released her report called Canada as a Conserver Society and said we have to use our resources much more efficiently and carefully and we should become world leaders in renewable energy. And the Canadian response was classic. Thank you, Dr. Franklin, a very good study. Put it on the shelf. Next, what's the next? You know, we forgot it. Denmark, on the other hand, said, we got problems. Windmills. And guess what one of the big part of their economy is? It's windmills. So uh, we should look to that history and ask ourselves, why are politicians incapable of, of responding in the right way? We're great at responding when there's a crisis. When there's blood on the ground, by God, do we respond. But something like climate change, which seems to be, well, I, I did the first show on climate, global warming back then in 1989, and I called it a slow motion catastrophe. So we knew about climate change back then, but we really thought, I thought it was decades away. I was more focused on clear-cut logging and pollution and dams on, on rivers. That was my priority. I thought we had time to work out the issue of climate change. But now, of course, we know it's happening and uh, we've clearly passed the target of 1.5. Uh, we will never make, uh, keep the temperature below that. Or, uh, and the two degree, the two degree target that's in the Paris Agreement looks increasingly difficult to achieve. So, you know, we're in this crazy situation where, in fact, the, uh, what is to come is going to reverberate very, very heavily through the lives of our, our children. And I, I'll tell you a story I told for the first time last night, and that is my daughter, my youngest daughter, is, and her family are living with, with me right now in our house. And they moved in with us in September so that they could have twins. And uh, just a, a story about that, it's a boy and a girl. And I said, oh, that's great. We'll name the girl Rachel and the boy Carson after my hero. My wife said, absolutely not. Because my last girlfriend before I met Tara was named Rachel. And Tara used to call her Rachel Ratchet. And uh, I said, Tara, you're like a goddamn elephant. You don't forget. That was 50 years ago. But she's still, Argh. So they're not named, she's not named Rachel. But uh, I, th I thought about it. But uh, I was sitting in, the, in our kitchen holding the, both babies at the same time. And I, being a grandfather is the greatest thing I, that's ever happened to me. Uh, and this is the first time that this ever happened. I began to weep. I began to weep. And of course, my wife and daughter grabbed the babies right away, and they're <laughs> saying, what's wrong? And then I began to wail. I've never done this in my life. I wailed uncontrollably for over 10 minutes because I realized these kids don't have a chance of living a full life. That's the reality. Environmentalists tell us what's coming, and we believe what we're saying. We're not just raising fears so that we'll get more support. We're headed in a... And then my grief turned to anger that people we elect to guide us into the future know full well what's coming and are still, in the name of corporate interest, still serving the economy and the things that are destroying the very the very life support systems of the planet. So this is the challenge we face. I'm over that now. I'm just, I'm accepting that we're living in this time when my grandchildren may very well die prematurely because life is going to get very difficult. But it gives all the more urgency. We've got to quit fooling around. This is a very urgent crisis. We have to do attack now. And we've got to stop people like Trudeau and, and McKenna from taking all these nice selfies and saying the right things. We need action on their part. And that's what you're here to say. We don't have time now for the green philosophy and view to be a part of every party. And so this is a moment 
where we need greens desperately because we've got the crisis of all times facing us. So please, all of you, support these, these candidates. Mike apparently has a good shot at it. I'm going down to help him tomorrow. But Jose, I'm there because Jose is part of my family and I'm there to support him whenever I can. I hope that you will go out and become ambassadors and, and you, if each of you could convince three people to support the Greens, that's the beginning of something big. And I watched... I, I watched all day as that march in Washington organized by the kids from Parkland in Florida. And I just cried all day, tears of joy at those young people. And this is, please, all of you, think about those young people. This is all about a future for them. And the Greens are the only party right now that has recognized that and put that up as the highest part of their agenda. Please support the candidates. that commitment to Paris. If we don't have that, then everything we do as individuals, yes, it, it has an effect, but it's a drop in the bucket to what, what we need now. We need some big decisions, and I believe that the responsibility then is that we have to get heavily involved in politics. As citizens and as adults who are concerned about the future we're leaving for our children, we've got no choice but to tell the people we elect to office to get the hell off the corporate agenda and start thinking about the decisions that are going to re reflect our children's future. I'm sorry. I, I really do have to go. I've had a very long day. Uh, I had a, a 7 o'clock breakfast, which is 4 o'clock our time. And, but thank you very much for coming out. Jose, Jose is the man. Thank you, David. I just want to say thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I know Jose and Karen, I'm assuming you, you'll be here to answer questions if people want to come up and ask personally. Um, and have a wonderful night and a safe trip home. Thank you. Happy Earth Day. Thank you, everybody. Wow. Happy Earth Day. <laughs>